So, without any more delay, I'd like to introduce Andrew Pitcher, Graham O'Reilly, and Shana Chu. Um, Andrew, do you want to start with a bit about, about yourself? Yeah. So, first off, uh, John, fair play to you for pulling this together. Uh, great initiative. Uh, and delighted to be part of it today. Um, so, my name is Andrew Pitcher, um, and I lead the sales development business in Zendesk. Uh, and I do so across EMEA. Um, so I've only been in the company about five months now. So I started in November after having been in LinkedIn for about five and a half years. And uh, in that time in LinkedIn, I did some various roles. So I did, uh, I did a little bit of sales ops, sales development, sales across SMB, a little bit across enterprise. And then, like I said, I, I made the move um, to Zendesk in November. So very passionate about sales, very passionate about uh, leadership. So I guess that's why I was keen to, to join today. So thanks for the invite. Sure. Uh, Graham, yourself? Yeah, once again, I want to back up what Andrew's saying there. You know, it's it's great to do this remotely, especially what's happening. It's good to keep things rolling. So hi, everybody. My name is Graham O'Reilly. Uh, I'm from Dublin Tech Summit, and I lead the startups program there called Vision X. Uh, what my role consists of is helping startups who have really innovative ideas to essentially use our platform, our event in Dublin for two days to grow. So my job is to find really cool companies, cool people, and put them in the room with investors, uh, massive multinational companies like Zendesk, uh, Google, uh, Facebook to HubSpot, uh, investor groups, uh, trade agencies and embassies, and also help them learn how to scale their business as well from some of our really cool speakers. So I've worked in two startups previously before, uh, managed small teams and large teams as well. So uh, yeah, excited to kind of share my knowledge and uh, tell people what Dublin Tech Summit and Vision X is all about. Cool, thanks. And yourself, Shana? Hi, everyone. So it's great to be here tonight um, in this online world. So I am the CEO and founder of StyleRap. Um, StyleRap is an artificial intelligence platform that is solving sizing and fit issues across the complete supply chain for um, online fashion retailers. So my background was clothing design, but I also was web developing and uh, digital marketing for the same company at the same time. So it was an extremely hands-on role, um, crazy hours for a good few years. And then I had this idea and jump ship. <laughs> so that's me. Cool. Um, yeah, so Graham, I'll start with you. Um, you. As you were saying there, you start, you've worked with a lot of startups over the past couple of years. Um, of the ones that are on their way or already being successful, um, was there anything that stood out about the people running them or the, the product that they provided? Yeah, like I think the first thing to always note is when you get into becoming a startup, if it's a massive leap like to take in that first step to go on your own because you know it's not really made for everybody. Like everybody can come up with an idea, all right, but to take the step as a startup is the biggest thing. So taking that first step. Um, and owning owning that step is very powerful. So the kind of CEOs that I've spoken to before that have taken that step always have a drive belief in the product, but they're also very aware that they always need to adapt and change. So like, and um, obviously Chana is a perfect example of that. You know, like her ability to be able to figure out that something wasn't working and then adapt her business uh, and now it's becoming like it's a really cool startup and what she's doing now especially in an industry that needs uh, what she's providing so i think something to take away from uh, what i see certainly in startup founders is that they always have a unique drive to always improve and are always quite selfless as well to kind of understand and adapt to ever-changing situations because if they don't adapt they die um so yeah. those are kind of things that really ring home when you talk to uh, various different founders yeah cool um so that kind of leads into shane or yourself so going by your pr career progression on linkedin there was a bit of an overlap between where you were like a, 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 a working with, at your previous position and where you took the plunge to be full-time in style the rap um what, what was the decision making process on that career change where you was there anything in particular that made you feel you were ready uh, no, it was an absolutely terrifying <laughs> thing to be faced with. I mean, leaving the security of your full-time job is is not easy for anyone to do. Um, 
I know at the time speaking to some family members, they were a bit, are you crazy to be leaving a full time job and starting out on your own? So I think what really helped me was the fact that I had gotten onto phase two in New Frontiers and I was getting, you know, New Frontiers phase two gives you 15K and having the money and the support and like what Graham said, I, I truly believed in this product. I knew that I would be able to solve some real issues that are facing um, the fashion industry. Now, when I actually quit my job, I was my product was completely different. It was actually going to be a virtual reality fitting room. And that was last year. And I've completely pivoted away from that. So it was completely being in love with the problem and like really wanting to solve that and believing that I, I actually have the skills to solve this and kind of attacking it. And um, so it was it was really having the support in a program like New Frontiers to kind of help me make that step. So it wasn't such a big leap for me having that support. It was more like a little nudge. <laughs> yeah, 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 cool. Um, and like, uh, uh, Andrew with yourself um, I find we, we, we talk about this a lot in all the different meetups a lot of people can sometimes struggle to move up into more senior positions and companies you just said there that you've moved around a bit in LinkedIn you moved up to the ranks um, uh, was there was there anything in particular that helped you along the way or was it just like old-fashioned hard work and great that you got you there um, the, re the reason I ask this is um, a lot of people have made it uh, don't make it known to their superiors that that they're they're available for a, a role that might be higher than their own position. Uh, is there anything you you think anything else? Yeah. So so um, I think one thing is is luck and timing. Um, so so what I mean by that is um, to to be in a position to get these roles, things have to be um, have to be in place. And I guess for me, I was lucky in that LinkedIn was growing so fast, right? Mm. So high growth company um, obviously gives you those opportunities. So that's one thing. And I guess that is. Um, part part look uh, and timing and um, you talked about hard work yes I think everyone um, that is progressing and progressing fast is generally putting in the, the, the hours and um, it doesn't happen by chance and um, but I guess one thing that that for me I always focused on was just actually making an impact and um, so, so generally trying to understand where are there are opportunities to make an impact in the company with your team um, and actually solve some challenges or go after some opportunities more aggressively. So that's tend, tended to be my approach to it. Yes, definitely hard work. Uh, I don't think anyone gets there without it. However, being very focused on, on actually making an impact, um, I think is the key because uh, we can all be busy fools. Yeah. So without that focus, um, that tends to happen quite a lot. And that's what I see a lot. And when you were making your first move from being like an individual contributor to a manager, what, how did you find that uh, transition into those roles? And was there any, was there any parts of it that were really difficult or really, really different to what you thought they would be? The, I have a tab um, open here. Yeah, it is tough. Sorry. So I didn't, I didn't get that one. No, I think, uh, one second. No, oh. no, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, um, so, so progressing into a manager role, yeah, it's scary, right? Um, so the first time you do it, um, you don't have all the answers, and um, you, you believe like you should, um, but you don't. Um, so it's scary. Um, again, my, my approach to it was um, uh, was probably a few different steps. One is um, giving yourself uh, the confidence that you can do the role. And I guess I did that through exposure, right? So I started out in sales ops in, in uh, LinkedIn um, and I got my first management opportunity within the sales ops function, um, where I was managing a couple of analysts and, and a few associates. So that's where I got my first opportunity. Um, so a very small team um, and it happened by chance, essentially my manager had left um, and moved on to a different role. So, so, so therefore I, I was given the opportunity to step up and all of a sudden I'm a manager, right? Yeah. So am I prepared? No. Um, but 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 I guess in terms of the prep, I, what I always did in advance of them was just always put my hand up to, to see if there was an opportunity for me to take on some of those management responsibilities. So whether that be stepping into a team meeting and leading a team meeting while the manager is gone, whether that be stepping in to lead the forecast call, whatever it may be, mm -hmm. uh, you're trying to look for those opportunities and, and, and that, that exposure. 
Um, so that's what I did. And, and, and I guess it gave me the confidence that, well, I don't know it all, but I know some things because I've already done it. Yeah. Um, so, so I guess like advice to some of the guys that are in IC roles, trying to step up into manager roles. One is like, I guess one would be um, like master your own role first. Um, because I guess if you're really good at your own role, um, it frees up time and it also gives you the opportunity to stand out. Mm. Um, and then after that is, again, just looking for that exposure. So putting your hand up um, for those opportunities uh, that may come your way so that as of when the opportunity to become a manager does arise, you, you kind of know something about it and, yeah. and you've already given yourself the confidence that you've done something uh, cool. in that space. Yeah, cool. And uh, I presume the both of you other guys have also gone through the same kind of process. Uh, Sh Shana, what about yourself? Yeah, so um, I, I completely agree with, with what Andrew has said. It is looking at those opportunities and kind of pushing yourself forward. And every time an opportunity arrives or you're asked to do something, it's it's kind of, I, I know a lot of it is, you know, you know how to say no. But I think when you're first starting out in your career, it's saying yes to great opportunities that come your way and jumping in feet first and trying it. And if it doesn't work, I mean, it's it's a great way to learn. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of sink or swim. So it's it's a great way to to learn. And especially when you're in a big company, you can afford to make mistakes and learn. So that was that was a good thing for me that I have worked in some big companies and if I had ever made a mistake, it was a great learning opportunity for me. Um, and now that I have started my own company, I know not to make those mistakes and I've learned from them. So whether you're you know looking to start your own company in the future or progress on to manager, I mean it's a, it's a great way to learn. Um, just throwing yourself into different opportunities and just see what happens. I mean, you could even decide that it's not even for you. You know, yeah. it, you're not going to know unless you try it. Yeah. And Graham, yourself? Yeah, like I would agree with uh, Shana and Andrew there. Like it's very much uh, learn fast, make mistakes, and then, you know, turn around and figure out how that happened as a team and then grow from that. So, you know, I wouldn't have had it too dissimilar But I think another thing to add is is when you're trying to become a leader is always to learn from other leaders as well, whether that's, you know, YouTube is so accessible now, you can read lots of different things, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's easy to pick up different types of leadership and see what works because every single person you pick on your team or ha you have on your team uh, reacts different to how you treat them, yeah. you know? So yeah, I would that... always be, yeah, I would always be very much uh, aware that everybody is different and what what works for somebody else uh, doesn't work for the other person. So, yeah, that that just on, on that note, we have um, all of our previous uh, there is all, of, all of our always find time to develop breaking up there a bit. Too, Graham. Yeah, I think you're good now. Um, yeah, just on that note, we have um, all of our previous speakers. We've been getting them before to give us um, to give us their recommendations for books, podcasts, all that. So I'm going to be reaching out to you guys afterwards just for that as well. But for anyone who's on the call, if you're looking for some reading material during the during the isolation, um, feel free to tip on over to the website to try and find it out. Um, so moving on to um, so a couple of things like there's one question that I, I tend to ask everyone because the answers vary so differently for for all the different people. Um, if you were interviewing for a different role or, or if you were interview into an interviewer um what trait would you look for in an employee um that you're hiring so andrew i'll start with you um so so for me it's probably something that's very difficult to assess but probably the most important um i, I like to see passion for the role and um, i like to see grit and um, because i i think uh that coupled with a bit of work ethic they'll get you they'll get you across the line in any role right so um I'd rather hire for uh, behaviors and um, than I would for hard skills. And the reason for that is um, you can learn skills. It's harder to learn behaviors. So generally, they're the three things that I'm looking for, and um, particularly in my world where we're, we're hiring um, early in career sales uh, salespeople, right? Mm. So um, if they have those right uh, behaviors, um, we can teach them the rest. Yeah. It's very difficult to do it in reverse. So, yeah. um, and the other thing is sales is difficult, right? So um, like uh, this current situation is a perfect example. 
So we don't know what's going to happen in Q2. Everyone's got targets. So um, what you're looking for is those people that um, have that grit, that resilience um, in these times because you need it. Um, and then in the normal times, what you're looking for is people that really want to step up um, and go above and beyond, right? Because that's often required too. So um, I hire more for behaviors than I would for a skill set um, would, be, would be my thing. So again, passion, grit, resilience, yeah. work ethic are probably some that come to mind. Cool. Uh, Graham, yourself? Yeah, like it, I, I think some, I think it's very important the type of person, you know, because meeting them face to face, you kind of get a feeling for who they are and what they've done before and how they hold themselves. So for me, it's very much, um, you know, they have to have the right traits uh, personality wise, like as Andrew was mentioning, great, because you can teach skills. Mm. You can teach somebody to, how to use, you know, your CRM system or how to write a perfect email or they can teach you something, right? So it's it's just that I think having the basic yeah. uh, things that Andrew was mentioning cool. or, or is what I look for. Yeah, Shane, or yourself? Um, I think for me, like, I, I do agree with the guys, but I take a bit more of a balanced approach, um, especially now at the minute. I mean, you know, looking at tech roles, um, I would hope that they would have some kind of coding skills before <laughs> I took the leap. Um, but even in previous roles, when I was hiring, I did get a bit stung on hiring based on personality and then having like it just absolutely blow up on my face because they weren't able to learn the skills, especially with like Photoshop or Illustrator. So I, I think for me, it's more of a balanced approach that they do have to have some kind of skill level. Um, but I do have to gel with them as well. I think it's important if you're going to be working with people um, you know, on every day, you have to know that the person, like if a conflict does arise that, you know, you can sort it out and work through it. And at the same time that you can have a laugh, I mean, work can get stressful. And especially for me in a startup at the minute, you know, it's, it, there is days when you kind of, you have to be able to bounce off people and, you know, say, right, today is, is not a good day or today is a good day. And, you know, you, you can bring each other up or, um, and, and, basically that so for me it's it's really a, a balanced approach when yeah. when hiring so you definitely personality but definitely have to have some kind of skills yeah, yeah. yeah so a, a lot of people on that um, topic of like hiring the right people um, a lot of leaders would use the phrase culture eat strategy for breakfast um, so apart from hiring the right people how would you uh, how do you build a better culture in the workplace um, Shane I'll stick with you there for that one so um, I, I've actually, because this is the first time that, you know, I've been the boss, um, I've been really interested in hearing um, how other companies are building culture. It's such a huge area right now and it's such a big thing. It's people are nearly even, you know, oh, I want to work for that company because I've heard of their culture or I don't want to work for them because I've heard of their culture. And um, there's been some very good cases as well of like, for example, the company away, uh, they make travel suitcases and they were touting themselves as, you know, one of the best cultures to work for. But then it came out that actually it wasn't. It was an extremely toxic work environment. So I think it's kind of a, an area that it's really hard to get right especially um you know for a startup yeah so i think for me it's like a good culture is one based on trust and open communication um being open and honest with each other and also a good balance between letting people work away at their own thing and also not micromanaging them so it's for me it, a good culture is you know open honest communication and a really good balance and I, I think as well like giving people the opportunity to be a little bit creative uh come up with new fresh ideas and uh, maybe work on projects i know google do that where you know i think it's like 30 percent of their time they're allowed to work on different projects and um, so doing things like that and uh letting people know that they're valued i think that's that's a good place to start and see where it goes from there yeah cool uh, anyone else want to chime in on that one yeah so i, I can give you my perspective um I, like i think I've, I've worked in a few companies and um my sense is and and generally the the companies i've worked for are, are a little bit larger so 
Um, I've had some exposure in, in most companies to the, the senior level um, executives. And for me, it starts with them um, because uh, they are the leaders in the organization. Therefore, people see them um, and how they act and they essentially replicate it, right? So what you permit, you promote. So, so I guess it starts with them and it has to be all the way down. But, um, but there's, there's lots of things you can do as a leader in an organization. And obviously that is lead and lead by example. So I think you have that onus, but I think one, one thing that's really, really important in the large organization and um, over time, the people that you hire add to that culture um, or they take away from that culture. So, so your hiring strategy is probably the most important thing in upholding or um, trying to enhance the culture. So most companies that I've worked in um, spend a lot of time on that. So we're not looking for somebody just to slot in we're looking for somebody to come in and actually enhance the culture. Mm. You're looking for creative people. You're looking for people that have ideas and um, that are, um, you know, obviously in sales, you're looking for hungry people. You're looking for, but you're also looking for that humility. You're looking for that um, team collaboration, that those types of things. But I think hiring is one thing that people neglect when it comes to the culture. That's probably the, the, the most important um, part of it for me. Yeah. And Graham. Yeah. Like, uh, both of them have said there is very is very true like i think culture is very important like for me though it's all about like being accountable you know like so if you hire particular people uh, they have to be know that they're well supported in the role so you know everything works for them they have all the tools they have all the training necessary and then you know you make sure that they enjoy their jobs like get to know them as people you know they get to know you you know um I think all of that is very important because then everybody feels supported. You know, you can have like little, um, like a thing we do in our, play, our workplaces, like every Friday we'll get up at 11 o'clock for 15 minutes and I'll have a cup of tea and just chat about stuff that's not related about work. You know, we're getting to know the people that you work with directly or that are on your team. So it's just about creating that environment that everybody feels they can be themselves and get their best work done. Um, and it's cool to learn about the people that you work with yeah. as well. Yeah, that's actually one thing that we've brought in over the last couple of weeks in our in our workplace. We are virtual coffee mornings just since we've been working from home. So we just ca go on for a half an hour, talk about anything but work. Um, and it's it, we'll probably try and continue it once we get back into the office. But it seems to be a really good way of just unwinding um, on a Friday and kind of prepping for the for the weekend, I suppose. Um, so moving on to kind of uh, some slightly tougher questions. Um, uh, so I'll start with Shana. Like, um, how do you get? So when you're like new to the leadership team, or even when you start in the startup, um, how did you get like uh, people to trust your decisions? Because you might be young, they might um, not think you're very senior to be making all these hard choices. How do you get people to to um, follow your for your your decision making? Oh, that's, that is a hard question. Good question. Um, I think for me, it was, for me really, it was kind of my experience. So, I mean, I had so much experience from even such a young age in, in fashion and in clothing manufacturing. So when I was speaking to um, large execs or large retailers, it was using their language um, and, because I was using their language and I was able to actually say, you know, I know about production and I know about the supply chain and they could kind of cut through it and see, yeah, okay, she knows what she's talking about. And because she knows what she's talking about, I'm actually going to listen to what she's saying. Um, I think that was, that was a good thing as well. As, uh, the other side of that as well is I had some really big ideas and some really big plans for the company. And I think it's starting out, it was more of a case of this girl is a little bit crazy. I'm going to listen to what she's saying just to see where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I had so much um, drive to sort all of these issues um, that I kind of forced them to listen to me, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, and uh... I suppose the same for both of you guys, probably kind of similar scenarios, Andrew. Um, yeah, so it's, it's never easy, right? Um, so for example, I, I just started in my organization in uh, November, so I'm five months in 
And then um, for me, there's always been a sense of that um, imposter syndrome, right? So you're, you're in this role and you're like, well, should I really be in this role? Am I fit for this role? Do I, am I able to make all these uh, decisions? So, so I've, I've always had that. And um, I guess I'm somewhat used to it now because um, every role I've ever had, I've never done before, right? So I, I've always had that sense of the imposter syndrome. And I think everyone probably moving into a leadership role gets at it to some extent. Um, but I, I guess it, it won't happen overnight in terms of um, getting the buy-in of the leadership team uh, across the organization. Um, but I do think uh, consistency over time probably leads to trust. So I think you, you've got to back yourself, you've got to trust yourself, and you've got to be consistent. Uh, I think you've got to believe that you've been hired for the role to make some of the decisions and provide some of the ideas. So I think it's it's going back to your own um, your own your own confidence uh, and and recognizing that you've been hired for this role. So therefore, you have already the backing of uh, the organization. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that that that's generally my sense of it. Um, but I think the consistency, like I think you've got to be consistent, um, and you've got to be consistent over time. And obviously, if you're doing some good work over over that period of time, that will build the trust, and and all of a sudden you're getting that buy-in. Um, but but quite frankly, I, I've never I've never struggled with it in any organization. I think I've been fortunate to work into uh, tech companies that certainly wouldn't have that pressure put on anybody that's new to the leadership team. So uh, I've been fortunate in that regard. Yeah. And Gra Graham, back to yourself, was there any times um, throughout your uh, career so far that you felt like you were in way above over your head? Uh, and how did you, you push through it? Yeah, like um, I think when I started in Dublin Tech Summit and I was told I was going to be, you know, tip to look after startups and stuff, like I really saw potential in what we could do with the program um, and really flush that out. So, but I think, you know, as Andrew and Trent were saying there, like you've got to be consistent, you've got to be open, you've got to be, what I also add to that is you've got to be very resilient as well. Like you've got to figure out solutions that what will work and what's of value and trust in your own skills because you have the job already you know, you're in the room, you're telling the leadership team what's what, and they're expecting you to deliver results because, you know, if, the, if you don't get results, the business can't function. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of, sometimes you feel like there's obviously the weight of the world on your shoulders, but then again, when, you know, you get really cool startups coming into my program or you have a really uh, massive partner like uh, from the European Union coming to your event, it's, it's really, that's the payoff. That's the that's the exciting part of it, you know. Yeah. So, I think you know, always remembering that, you know, you're adding value to somebody somewhere, um, and it pays off uh, yeah. with continued uh, consistency and being very resilient uh, is something I would. Cool. Uh, um, yeah, and uh, Shana, for yourself, um, over the next year or two, are you focusing on on product development or are you focusing on customer growth? Um, um, I think, I, I honestly think it's a kind of a little bit of both. Um, like there's there's so many issues within the fashion industry right now that we want to get to as many retailers as possible. Um, but at the same time, we want to make sure that the product is actually doing what we're saying it's doing. Um, so I'm kind of going to take a balanced approach to it and hopefully it works. Obviously, if, if one area seems to be falling down and, you know, if customer retention isn't so good or if customer sales aren't so good, then, you know, it, it, more focus needs to be on that area. And likewise, if we're getting loads of customers, but, you know, product development is kind of going off the deep end, then that needs to, that, that needs to be looked at. So for the next year or two, I'm going to, a try with a balanced approach and hopefully that will work <laughs> yeah yeah so a, a quote i heard there um a couple of weeks back is uh, that some people say there's a gap in the market but there may not actually be a market in the gap um andrew you've worked on a lot of different teams in linkedin that would have worked on new solutions and stuff how can you make sure that your product or solution is viable and fit for market that's a <laughs> that's a tough question right <laughs> um so marketing the gap a gap in the market um some 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 companies create the market right so so we've seen that uh, also 
Um, so uh, in terms of the product, yeah, like you, you, you'll see most tech companies roll out product and they test it, right? So they test it with a small user group. It's in that that you'll generally get the feedback, right? And, and a, lot of, a lot of product that is set to, to launch doesn't because of that um, beta testing. Um, so, so like, I, I guess the, the testing is key, right? So you're getting your user group, you're putting them together, you're asking them, hey, listen, we pulled this thing together. It's not perfect. Tell us what you think. That's generally what I've seen in the past work quite well. Uh, I've seen a lot of um, great enhancements made on the back of that feedback too. Mm. Your, 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 your customers um, are probably your best sense of feedback. Well, 100% they're the best sense of feedback. Um, so asking them um, and, and putting it to them and seeing if it actually is adding value is generally the best approach I've seen and, and I've seen it work quite well. Yeah, and the same for you, Graham, I suppose. Yeah, so like I think if particularly startups, if they kind of adopt a, an, a, an agile, lean kind of enterprise model and start testing fast, figure out what works, what doesn't, you can see a lot of success and lead to you know a lot of unique ideas. Um, so you know that's that's something that I'd really uh, bring home. Uh, you know, is get a product out there, and you know another thing I'd also say as well, if that product works, like don't stop growing. Like, don't cut yourself off from becoming the next big thing. Because what I find as well, a lot of particular startup owners or CEOs, founders, they only want to get to a certain level. And when they hit that certain level, they're happy. But then somebody else is creating something even bigger again, and then they get surpassed. So it's to always keep innovating is something I'd also add as well. Yeah. And Shana, you're kind of in the middle of it right now. So I suppose what's your take on that one? Um, yeah, it's it's definitely a good question. And this is something that we have come up across. So um, when I originally had the idea for a VR wardrobe, you know, it was, I was like, yeah, definitely, everyone's going to want this. And it was actually when I went out to the market, it was like, the market was no, <laughs> this is, we, we're not, we're not ready for this yet. We need something that's quicker to build or, you know, that's more effective. The technology for a VR wardrobe wasn't quite there yet. Mm. So, I mean, it's something that we look at further down the line, but in order to solve some real issues, we definitely need needed to pivot. So there was a gap in the market, but the market was not interested in, in that idea. So since we've gone back out to the market with our new solution, now we're getting some real traction and you know people are genuinely interested and saying yeah this this definitely could work you've you've gotten it now so yeah i i think going out into the market and actually asking them asking your customers asking you know ask anyone who would be a potential customer is this something that you would be willing to part money with for then then I think you're on the right track there. If you don't ask your customers, then you're definitely setting yourself up for failure. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we got one question there from uh, Phoebe. So aside from what you look for in a hire, is there any noticeable red flags that might make you veer away from hiring someone? Uh, go to Andrew for that one. Um, yeah, so, so uh, loads. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so uh, feedback, right? So. so um, generally when i'm when i'm interviewing somebody i will try to find somebody that knows them somebody that's worked with them um and uh i i know it's a contentious uh one but but i do think it's probably the best source of information and um, i've uh not proceeded with candidates because i know people that have managed a person have worked with a person and um there may be two or three people in that company that I know, and they've given the same feedback. Like this person is not someone that you want to hire. Mm. So, so um, that's that's the first one, right? Um, so, so I always look for I always look for people's input because I think it's probably the most valuable source of information. Um, but um, how they prepare for the interview is usually a good indicator. So, um, for the most part, there's there's generally a case study or two involved in in an interview process within sales in a tech company. <clears throat> their their effort um, and how they prepare for that is usually a great indicator. Um, you can tell if someone just slapped together a presentation, wasn't prepared and did it in two hours versus somebody that spent the weekend rehearsing, uh, preparing. So, so that's, that's another one. 
Um, but then the, the ability to kind of hold a room um, and build rapport, like I think we all talked about this before, like somebody you want to work with generally can do that, right? And certainly in sales, it's important. So so how they conduct themselves um, and how they build rapport is, is another thing. So there, there are three things that would be like, if, if they're not successful in those areas, they're, they're massive red flags for me. Yeah. Uh, Shana, yourself? I completely agree with Andrew. Like, uh... It, rapport is definitely one of the big things for me um, now that I'm in a startup um, as well it's kind of being honest about your skills like if there's areas that you know could be improved upon you do have most of the skills but you know there's one lacking so for example for me um, if I was hiring for a tech developer role right now uh, they may not be able to you know work with artificial intelligence but if they're willing to look into it and willing to learn about it and they can code well then you know that's something so if they're honest about that like if they say oh yeah i'm the best ai coder ever i can do everything in it you kind of they lose credibility straight away you're kind of like this is a joke um it is definitely how they prepare for it as well um i kind i always find that you know if they are really interested. They'll ask some really good questions at the end of the interview. So it kind of shows that they've done their homework and they've researched you or they've researched the company. And if they ask you really good questions, um, I think that that really helps as well. It shows that they're really actually interested and really want this job. Mm. So that that kind of, if they don't bother kind of asking questions or, you know, they kind of seem like they're not really interested, that that would be a big red flag for me as well. Uh, yeah, and completely Graham, agree. Yeah, uh, great, Graham. I pose you a different question there now. So, um, a lot of people have difficulty uh, when they're when they're moving into a different role in a different company, or they're just looking or interviewing or whatever. They they're trying to figure out what, how the, how to find out if the company is the right fit for them, or if they're if they want to move into it. One of our previous speakers said that um, her tip was that she goes into um, the interview room about maybe or she sits in the reception about 20 minutes beforehand gets there really early kind of gets susses out the the environment in reception like are people talking to the receptionist uh, the secretary in the front is is the environment friendly and that's one of her ways of doing it was is there any other way that you for kind of figure out yourself moving moving to different companies uh yeah so probably something a bit unique to myself is you know it's always interesting to figure out where their local pub is and if they all go drinking together. <laughs> <laughs> so a perfect example would be um, uh, Twitter are right beside uh, the Gingerman pub. That place is always packed out pretty much after. It seems like a good place to work yeah. with people. Yeah. Do you know yeah, what I mean? So yeah, no, that's a good one. I, yeah. I think I think if you find out that like um, you know going into reception, I've done that myself before. Glassdoor is obviously a great one too. LinkedIn, knowing people in the company is a, probably a, a real powerful one too, and not just the recruiter, like not just the sales manager who's trying to hire you. Uh, like I mean, actual people uh, that you can reach out to and be like, hey, uh, I want to work in this company. What's it really like? And they'll give you an actual breakdown of day to day. Um, which is probably the best thing. And if you don't know anybody in that company, uh, connect with them because yeah. you know LinkedIn can be very powerful that way. Yeah. But no, something that I've done a bit unique myself is just to see like, you know, where, where is close to the company. Like I know um, other companies that go to like certain bars around Dublin and it's just to go in and see what it's like because then you can actually really see if the people get on with each other. Yeah, and, yeah, good uh, point, yeah. Yeah, any other input there, for Andrew or Shanna? Yes, so I think knowing somebody in there that you trust is like, like that's invaluable, um, uh, because they'll give you the best insight. Um, but I think the way I look at the interview process, I, I very much look at it as a two way street. So uh, certainly, um, I, I I have interviewed in, in other companies, not since joining this one, yeah. um, but but <laughs> but um, but, I, but I've interviewed and uh, they tend to the. the the, the more senior you go in any company, the, the longer the process uh, appears to be. And um, in, in in this interview process, I know there was probably 10 or 11 um, different people I spoke to. And for me, that was so valuable because I really get a great insight into uh, the company. Because the more people you meet uh, at, a, at a leadership level, the, the, the greater the insight. So I, I very much use the interview to 
almost interview them as well, right? So um, yep. I tend to ask a lot of questions around the culture um, and I tend to reverse it a, a lot of the time. And I've done that in other companies and having asked those questions of several leaders, um, I, I've made a decision not to go there because of their response or uh, because of how they um, respond to certain situations or their thoughts on culture. So uh, I, I think uh, the interview process is probably one of the, the best opportunities to get a sense of it. Gotcha. Um, so I, I would use that as a great opportunity and obviously anyone in the company. Mm. Shana? Yeah, com completely agree. Um, so uh, like what Andrew was saying, um, asking questions like that, that really is, I mean, I know if I was hiring someone and they were asking me questions about, especially culture, culture right now, I mean, it's it's me and two other people at the minute. So it's a really, really small team. So <laughs> I would kind of be like, well, you know, our culture is very small at the minute. So, um, you know, it's, I think the questions that um, I've asked before when, when going for roles, um, it was around culture. It was it was kind of about um, progression as well. So I always wanted to learn. I always wanted to know what the next thing was, you know. Um, so that that was a, a thing for me, asking if there was a chance of progression in the role. I mean, if you got the role and there was no progression, then it wasn't something that really interested me. So it was asking kind of questions like that. And again, what the guys were saying, it's knowing someone who was there as well. I mean, we've all heard horror stories of people working at companies and they're like, oh my God, I'd never work there. And, you know, I, I would trust people that are in the role. And if they're, if they hate the company, then it's definitely kind of puts a red flag and you just won't go and interview with them yeah. even. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's fair. Um, Andrew, just one for yourself there. If you were if you were speaking to someone who was about to go into into sales or a sales position, what what advice would you give to them? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so uh, I guess so. So they're, they're they're starting out in sales. It's their first gig in sales. Yes. Yeah. Um, I, I would say uh, probably a few things. Uh, patience. Um, is, is first off, you're not going to be you're not going to be uh, great in your first week. You're probably not going to be great in your first six months. It takes time. It's like anything. So with that, um, probably practice a whole bunch, right? So I think people believe that you know uh, sales is a God given talent. Uh, I would I would disagree. Um, I think there's a, there's a science element to it, um, but there's also an element of learning your craft. You've got to practice. And so learning your craft, I guess, is another piece of that would be like sit with the best performers. So the guys that are top of the dashboard every month, every quarter, every year, who are they and what do they do? Mm -hmm. Shadow them. They're doing something right. Um, and don't just shadow the top performer, shadow the top five, because, again, they probably have different styles and they probably do things differently. And um, so, so I, I would say practice. Um, I would say be patient because it is going to it is going to take time. Uh, shadow the top guys um, and then just prepare yourself it, it's uh, it's um, it's like a roller coaster right sales is yeah. up and down and um, all of a sudden you're you feel like the greatest person in the world when you're smashing your number and then all of a sudden the coronavirus comes <laughs> along and you're looking at your you're looking at your dashboard and you're like oh shit yeah. um, so, so you got to be prepared for that and um, the resilience piece is really important yeah um, uh, Graham, for yourself, you, you said to me before that the, the Tech Summit is, is working closely with a lot of tech companies around Ireland. Can you just uh, give like a bit more explanation of what kind of people um, in startups can get from the Tech Summit and what you have to offer? Yeah, so like uh, first off, like if you're any particular startup wanting to go to any particular tech event, like in Ireland, Dublin Tech Summit is the one because you know, we bring thousands and thousands of attendees from all over the globe, like 70 plus countries, with 200 of the most innovative speakers, Eric Wan, head of Zoom, like French Workwell, head of Chief Operations with SpaceX. Like these people are talking about what's happening next, mm. you know, and you get access to all of that content. And secondly, if you're a startup, you know, it's an opportunity to put your brand on a massive platform as well. So like if you come to our events, like uh, obviously Shanna is in September, which is uh, great. You know, it gives you the opportunity to be in the room with different types of people, investors. Um, you know, we have the Chinese and American uh, trade agencies coming, you know, 
there's bigger partners being involved as well, like HubSpot and Segment. You know, so you're getting in the room with investors, massive multinational companies, trade organizations and embassies. And it doesn't stop there as well. Yeah. Like great partners like Dublin City Council and Dublin Chamber are running mentoring and are matchmaking. So getting dedicated one to one meetings with potential investors for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, you know, can be super valuable to um, any startup. Yeah. You know, pitching directly to an investor, like who else is going to do that for you? Yeah. Um, getting mentors by, in, by Dublin City Council, like having de dedicated mentorship for like an hour or 40 minutes or so. It's it's really great. And again, we, we're probably the gift that keeps on giving with the learning too, because we have a dedicated stage um, for startups to learn how to grow their businesses and scale them from top CEOs. Yeah. So it's a it's basically anything a startup could want in one room for yeah. two days. Yeah. And then also we try to make sure they have a bit of fun too. You know, we bring That's them important. out to, yeah, the, the night vision party, which is always a good laugh. And obviously, you know, if anybody wants to go, let us know. <laughs> yeah. yeah cool. We've got another question there from Julia. Um, so she is, she has two questions actually. And how, how do you support diversity and what are the challenges of leading a diverse team? Uh, so uh, Shana. Yeah, so this is something that that is quite big for me. Um, obviously, you know, we all know that there is a huge um, imbalance in female roles in tech. Um, and it is something that I'm really aware of when I'm going to be hiring for roles for the company. Um, I mean, I've I know of other startups who, you know, have posted jobs and not one woman applied for it um, uh, so I think this comes to a confidence thing um, I heard before that um, not to be stereotypical now or anything but I read before that when both genders read a job description that a woman looks at it like as a perfectionist and she needs to take every single box whereas a man might look at it and go, right, okay, I only really have half of these, but I'm still going to take a chance anyway, and I'm still going to go for it and apply for it. So I think it's having the confidence, um, women need to have more confidence and apply for the roles um, and take a chance and go for it. So I'm hoping that when I start um, advertising roles, that I, I do um, get an influx of, you know, really diverse characters, because I, I do want a diverse team. I mean, diversity is the you know how creativity is born but yeah. i think going to um female tech events it's it's kind of it, it's good because i'm starting to see that there is actually a lot of really strong female tech out there so that that's a big one for me as i go forward yeah and andrew yeah so i think shannon touched upon like the the diversity piece from a from a gender balance perspective and um i know in tech that that does seem to be the case and it is the case um again fortunately in in, in my role and, and in previous roles in sales i've i've had 50 50 uh, gender balance and 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 better which is great um but i think the the challenge um is to what shanna said is is the uh, is the application process right so uh, i've had i've had roles open where um, I've had a hundred applicants and 90 of them will be male. Hmm. So, so the application process, I, I think is something we need to figure out. I think there's a misunderstanding about what tech is. And, and I do think, um, and again, I can't speak for females, but I think they're deterred from it in, in some cases and, and it happens in sales too. So I think we need to be a little bit more open and transparent about what it is and, and try to unearth like what, what the what the issue may be. But I think some of the things you can do around it are uh, not begin the interview process until you actually have a, a, a gender balanced panel. Mm -hmm. So, of, or sorry, of, um, uh, a pool of candidates, should I say. So, so, and that's something I have done. I won't begin interviewing process until I actually have enough females uh, in, the, in the talent pool. Yeah. So, so that's how I do it. Um, but plus, um, uh, I think organizations are aware of it, and I think there are some organizations that are doing that. Um, but but certainly it's something that has worked for me. But again, I, I've worked in companies where the, the, you get so many applicants for roles will always have some females 
it's just a lot less than the male population that we would have. But certainly um, having um, a process in place whereby the, the interview uh, doesn't start until you have that, um, that talent pool. But I think the diversity goes uh, beyond just uh, male and female as well, right? So um, what you're trying to do is build the most diverse team you can for me in sales. Um, so what you're looking for is different approaches. You're looking for different backgrounds. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is build a team that replicates um, your customer base, right? And if you're build if you're building a team based on somebody that looks just like you, well, you're not going to probably be representative of your of your customer base. So they're kind of the two lenses that I look at it. Is um, like how can I build a team that reflects our customer base? The other thing is certainly very conscious of the the, the gender balance and and certainly um, what I do is I put in place that uh, that blocker um, yeah. until we have that that split. Yeah, uh, Graham yourself. Yeah, I think you like to add on to what both have said before me. I think if you've got to really show that your company is diverse first off, if you want diverse people to apply. So like what we've done, obviously, in Trash and Women's Day, was like a few, like back a month or so ago. So like, you know, we're sharing content on that of our whole team and who inspires them, you know, and our team in Dublin, Texan one is very diverse, people from all different types of backgrounds. And it's great and it brings forward the you know real cool ideas and unique ideas and you know lets you understand people from different perspectives that you might not have known of before which is great you know so i think though um it's important to be realistic in the sense that you know there is uh, like a deterrent but you've also got to show like why your place is cool and unique and you know making sure that you're showcasing that you are a diverse workplace and inclusive as well of all people of all backgrounds because you know, that's the way ireland is at the moment yeah. and that's a beautiful thing yeah yeah great and i've got well, i go with one more question we have from ed um how are you finding the remote working experience uh like it obviously can't beat the human interaction but um how, how are you kind of working around it are you doing anything different anything to kind of cope uh, Shane, I'll go to you I've first. Stopped eating. <laughs> I've stopped eating biscuits this, at the moment. <laughs> um, yeah, for for me, it's it's kind of it, it's a challenge, but you know, it's I'm, I'm still going to do it and go at it. Um, I I naturally prefer being in front of people and being face to face um and especially uh like i'm at such a crucial time in my startup as well you know i was about to go into my first funding round so um for me it, it really is a challenge but i am finding it that the like this week has been a real testing week because i've had so many calls but I'm, I'm actually starting to become a lot more comfortable with it i'm still a bit like Whoa, when i see a camera in front of me but I'm, I'm getting there. I'm becoming a lot more comfortable. Practice, practice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Andrew? Yeah, so, so I, I would agree. Like, I, I have a strong preference for face-to-face. -face. I, I love being in the office. I love being on the sales floor. I like the... I like the I like a, a fast environment. Um, and uh, it's a little different, obviously, when we're, um, when we're online. Um, but there's lots of benefits, right? So, so for me... Um, the commute right so so I, i'm dealing with it fine i don't have to do my commute from malahide every day yeah so i saved myself about two hours so that's great um the other thing is how i'm dealing with it i think i think uh, in my role it's tricky right because i've got i've got over 40 people um and uh they're stretched across um various different countries even at this stage because many people went back home so um what i'm very conscious of is, is bringing the team together as often as i possibly can and um, over commuting or over communicating, should I say, um, and really stressing on that. And um, because I think in this type of environment, people are anxious, they're probably a little stressed, they're, they're not used to this environment. So I think the communication and the togetherness, I think that piece is really, really important. So trying to focus on that and uh, enjoying my uh, non commute. Yeah, and Graham, I finished with you. Yeah, so like uh, I think uh, trying to just adjust to the the different changes, like uh, I'd be like uh, Andrew, I'd love kind of the fast environment and being on a kind of a, a kind of a sales floor, if that makes sense, um, to just kind of have interaction with people as well, like uh, Shannon was mentioning as well. It's I'm a very much a people person, 
but then again it also gives you time to kind of do a bit of self-reflection of how you can improve and stuff like that which is always nice um but you know yeah it's 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 been different but uh, i'm looking forward to kind of getting eventually back into the office and kind of face-to-face communication because you know internet's lag you know you lose yeah. connections with people you know you don't want to be stuck in endless meetings staring at a screen you want to be actually doing some work and feeling productive so yeah you know it's it's it is a change but you know i'm sure we'll yeah. get more used to it as time goes on yeah okay um yeah i can see we're coming up on the hour now so i'm just going to finish uh firstly by thanking everyone who joined us online thanks for the questions and uh for for um staying tuned and obviously massive thanks to you guys for joining um you've given us a really really good discussion this evening um and for anyone who's missed the part of the talk uh, you should be able to catch it on either the youtube channel the podcast channel or over on the website over the coming days i'll be posting all this on the linkedin whenever i have everything available so again thanks everyone for joining and um i'll talk to you at the next one cheers cheers guys thanks for having us take care thanks See you.